And this is the Stella Culinary School Podcast, found online at StellaCulinary.com. My name is Jacob Burton. Thank you so much for joining me once again. Coming at you live, this time from our YouTube channel. Uh, this is the secondary YouTube channel, so some people get confused. Uh, I have my main YouTube channel, which uh, I have neglected. It's up to about 138,000 subscribers now, and I've been missing in action for about a year. Uh, but that is youtube.com slash Jacob Burton. That's where I post all my technique videos. And we did some live streams over there back in the day. There was a, a group of people that really enjoyed them. We get maybe about 1,000 viewers um, out of, you know, the 100,000 I had subscribed. But I just kind of clogged up the channel. So here we have a secondary uh, YouTube live stream channel. And uh, we're going to give this a shot. We were doing it in our Facebook group, which is still active. Shout out to the, the Stella Culinary Facebook group. You can get there by facebook.com slash groups slash Stella Culinary. The thing I didn't like about that, though, was <clears throat> there would be live comments. And uh, Facebook would choose which ones I would see live. And then later I'd go back and I'd be responding to comments in that thread. And I would see certain comments and be like, damn, that was a good comment. And uh, I, I totally missed it, and I would have loved to have answered it live. So we're going to just kind of keep on working this thing um, until we uh, figure out what's going on here. But we do also have our uh, Discord channel, uh, which there's links everywhere on that. Uh, if you're on the email list, uh, when I send out the notification later, there will be a link in that. I'll drop a link in this podcast uh, show notes, which is basically just the description of the podcast when you pull it up on your player. All right. So... Did everyone have a good Super Bowl? Did everyone uh, cook something delicious? I did. I cooked some pulled pork in my uh, Anova Comp meal. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Maybe we'll do another update on the oven. I'm liking it more and more, but uh, I don't want to get into that right now. However, with all the new people that are, are joining the podcast, uh, you know, we definitely have been um, getting more new listeners, and I can tell it's by by word of mouth. Because uh, they'll they'll email me or they'll shoot me like a private message and be like, hey, I just found your podcast and you know my my son or my friend they, or my boss they told me, hey, this is the the best podcast in the culinary universe, and the best culinary podcast in the entire universe. I said, ah, that's that's my people. So now when you're out there telling people about the podcast and telling them how it is the best podcast in the culinary universe or the best culinary, po we got to get our messaging right, right? The best culinary podcast in the universe. And then you say, this guy, Chef Jacob, he's like the Tom Brady of culinary podcasters. And they'll think, like, wow, he must be good. He must be good. All right. So I posted in our Facebook group um, a little thing on what you would like to discuss. And I have like nine pages of notes here uh, that you can see. And we got a lot of great comments. We will have a lightning round um, a little bit. But I think today, because it seems to be uh, an ongoing trend, yet John has it right. It is the best culinary podcast in the universe, hosted by the Tom Brady of culinary podcasters. And one of the, the things that I've been seeing a lot lately, and this fits into a lot of what we've been discussing, uh, is questions on execution and, and, and prep and meal prep and how to prep ahead and and all of those things kind of fit together um, and I think it's a really good uh, discussion point not only because a lot of people are asking about it but as we talk about in the f-step curriculum uh, execution is where so many people fail uh, it's it, in fact it's the most common failure point and when you look at a you know just any sort of cookbook they have the beautiful picture of the recipe and uh, you know, this is how it looks when you serve it, and if you plate it all nice on a fancy plate, and they walk you through the story of how they discovered this recipe or how they created it, and they, uh, you know, so you go through and you make it. What they never discuss, because it's kind of boring, but really the most important part, is how to actually execute and how you can prep ahead. And this is what professional chefs do uh, all day, every day, is they prep ahead and they execute what we call all the minute, right? We don't um, cut vegetables to order. We don't blanch vegetables to order. Uh, we don't butcher meat to order, order, obviously. And I constantly get this question of what 
can I prep ahead? What can I cook ahead? And John, I appreciate you saying that Tom Brady is the Jacob Burton of football. I do agree. And the thing with prepping ahead and what you can get away with cooking ahead, right? The answer to that question is almost anything and everything, right? Especially when you start talking about proteins with sous vide and your combi ovens and rethermings and stuff like that. But we'll get down that path here um, in a little bit. But I want to walk you through uh, my uh, weekly prep flow uh, for home, right? Uh, just as, as an example. So you can kind of wrap your head around uh, the execution side. Because, again, it's really all about properly planning uh, your prep. So that way you can just get in the kitchen and cook. So just like everybody who's listening to this podcast and who enjoys cooking at home, I have a day job that keeps me really busy. The fact that I'm, I'm a chef means I have a couple of tips and tricks and hacks to get me through this. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm working a, a, a 10, sometimes 12 hour shift, recently more like 10 hour shifts, which is nice. And I get home, I don't have a whole lot of time to prep and cook a meal. Um, but I don't want to eat out either uh, constantly. So what I do is on my weekends, I prep ahead. And your standard meal during the week, at least my standard meal for me, is going to consist of, of three things. And you guys know what those are. What are they? That's right. It's a protein, a starch, and a vegetable. Now, your, your starch can actually be left out on certain nights. So there's some nights where I do just uh, a protein and a salad. It's a little bit healthier, right? Um, and then... Your, your your vegetable could be, you could double up and do a veg, or you can double up and do a salad. Okay, so you can do like salad veg, you can do a protein uh, salad, vegetable starch if you want to go crazy. But you got to start thinking about what you're going to cook ahead. So I start my week with going to, or start my, my sort of weekend prep, usually with a, a Costco run because you can buy stuff in bulk. And, uh, you know, instead of buying, you know, a couple, you know, things of this, a couple things of that, you know, I'll buy a bag of new potatoes, a bag of sweet potatoes. That's where I get my rice. Um, that's where I get, you know, a couple of whole chickens, a couple of tri tips. And then I go home and I start prepping usually on a, a, a prep day. Uh, so sometimes it'll be like a Saturday or Friday. All, um, grab something that's easy to cook, right? So I'll do like a roasted chicken or maybe I'll even grab like a rotisserie chicken from Costco, something that's easy. So that way I can really actually focus on my prep. Because if you're trying to focus on like executing a dinner uh, while prepping for, you know, a, a, your upcoming week, it's going to, you're going to get locked up. It's going to be kind of difficult to do. Okay. So this is when you put in your earbuds, Right. Uh, you listen to some good music, or maybe you listen to some older episodes of the best culinary podcast in the universe, and you get some inspiration going, but you're kind of just zoning out. You're having fun, you're in your zone, and you're working and you're prepping, okay? And you want to start thinking of your prep flow as far as cross-contamination, cleanup, and the utilization of your cooking vehicles, Okay. So, for example, if I'm going to be prepping a bunch of proteins, I'll usually do that first, okay? And I'll prep in the order of the, the least amount of cooking necessary to not kill me. So, if I'm going to prep tri-tip, if I need to, right, I'm going to prep the tri-tip first because it's beef. I'm going to cook that to mid-rare. If I'm going to prep fish, I'll prep fish before the beef, uh, but that's kind of interchangeable. Be careful, though, because the fish can transfer in your cutting boards. You want to always make sure you're washing in between, but especially with the fish, right, with the flavor and stuff. And then I'll leave my poultry or my chicken to last. So a common uh, prep workflow for me would be something along the lines of this. I get a side of salmon from Costco. I take off the skin. I trim up the belly. I freeze the belly uh, so I can make raviolis or salmon cakes from that later down the road where I'm feeling kind of ambitious. I take the salmon. I slice it up into individual portions. I have a video on portioning uh, salmon at cellcorner.com slash CKS. That's our culinary knife skills unit. And 
all uh, usually just put those in a in a Ziploc bag, maybe a little bit of salt on them um, to kind of dry brine, uh, which isn't fully necessary. You can also wet brine them, five uh, percent for thirty to sixty minutes. That's going to help to hold the albumin in. Okay, but that's all optional stuff. Just you know, salmon is is pretty straightforward, and I'll stick that in the fridge. Salmon is a great. Uh, and you guys would, Jacob, I thought you hated salmon. I do hate salmon, but it's healthy, and my girls like it, and my wife likes it, and my daughter likes it. And you throw some lemon juice on it, it's not that bad, right? You need a little side salad. So I'll uh, portion up that salmon, stick it in the fridge, and that's a really quick uh, weeknight pickup. You know, you can get all fancy with your salmon, but just a, a sear on one side or a pan roast. Um, I have a, a little griddle that I love, right, um, that I'll sear my salmon on. It takes like 10 minutes tops, you know, start to finish. So salmon, rice, salad, boom, you're done. Maybe, maybe a couple lemon wedges on the side. So my salmon's portion. Now I'll take my tri-tip. I usually buy the two-pack uh, from Costco. And, you know, I, I eat steak and stuff too, but, you know, tri-tip's a good universal meat. So I'll take one tri-tip. I'll slice it up and I'll do the alkaline marinade, which we have uh, been discussing in previous episodes. And I have a video coming up on this. This will be on the main YouTube channel. But it's our, our basic a little bit of baking, so a little bit of salt and then some umami ingredients, right? So your uh, your soy sauce, uh, maybe a little dash of oyster sauce, and a little bit of cornstarch to hold all together. I'll take that sliced meat. This could easily be pork loin. It could be easily be chicken. But this is going to be a stir fry later on in the week, okay? So I'll put that in a Ziploc bag. That goes uh, into the fridge as well. Then I take the second tri-tip, put it in a Ziploc bag, dump in my favorite marinade. You guys know I love teriyaki. It can be anything you want. You can do a dry rub. You can... uh, I got some uh, some Meat Church barbecue rubs for Christmas from the... uh, from the crew at the uh, hotel, uh, which was very nice. And I, I've been really liking the meat church a lot. Uh, so maybe you want to go more sort of like dry, um, you know, dry rub. So you can hit it with a little bit of your seasoning, pop it in your Ziploc bag, pop that uh, in your fridge. Okay, now you got another uh, marinade piece of meat ready to go. Then I'll take my whole chickens. If I got it, sometimes I buy thighs, sometimes I buy breasts. Depends on what I'm doing. Okay, I'll break down my chickens, take the carcass... If I'm feeling ambitious, um, I'll roast them to make stock. A lot of times I don't, though. A lot of times I just throw them in the stock pot, and then I'll just I'll, I'll make my stock with it, right? Uh, in the in the pressure cooker. So it's 45 minutes, 60 minutes, start to finish. I'm not throwing in a bunch of mirepoix. I'm not throwing in a bunch of other ingredients, right? Because what I'm doing is I'm just trying to quickly, just in my workflow, boom, break down the chicken. The carcass goes in the the pressure cooker, bring it up to pressure, uh, make my stock. Now I have something that I can't buy from the store, which I do buy stock, by the way. I do buy the boxed stock uh, because there are times where you want to use it. You don't want to use your good stuff. The actual chicken stock that I'm making in this pressure cooker is just a really quick extraction of the chicken flavor plus the gelatin, right? And then you save that for later. So later on in the week, maybe you want to make a pan reduction sauce. Maybe you want to use it for braising something. That's all good things. When you need a little splash of uh, chicken stock or broth in, say, like a stir fry that we're going to do, right? Uh, I use the box stuff for that because it's not a ma- it's not a massive flavor component. It's not a really important part of the flavor structure. I just need a little bit of liquid there to kind of get all the juices to mingle and to play nicely. From there, you can do any number of things to your your, your chicken pieces. Uh, you could cross cut the breast and turn that into um, another stir fry dish if you like. Uh, you could just save it as is, pan roast it. But now would be a good time to either drop it in a brine or to do a dry brine. So now our meat prep is done. I'm sitting there rocking out, you know, listening to some some music, and uh, you know the the earbuds are in and just kind of ha- having a good time. Now you're gonna break everything down. You're gonna clean it up, and it's time to prep. If you're gonna prep uh, your vegetables at all. So for me, I eat a lot of salads. Now I really like these salad kits at Costco, and yeah, you you would think that Costco has like, you know, uh, an advertising deal with me, but they don't. I just like shouting out the people that I like to make your lives easier. So Costco has this Mediterranean salad kit, which is pretty solid. They also have a um, like a superfoods with kale that's solid. And that's great because it's prep is ready to go. You throw it in your vegetable drawer. You're in a pinch, right? You're coming home rushed from work. And it, as long as you got a protein and a salad, you're good. You're good to go. You're golden, right? Also, too, for leftovers, here's a little leftover trick that's kind of on the healthier side is uh, – Mission Tortillas does a great uh, carb balance, like whole wheat tortilla. That's solid. The macros on it are great. The, it's like, 
you know, depending on the size, it's anywhere from 80 to 100 calories, you know, per, per tortilla. And uh, your leftover meat from the night before, whether it's chicken or whatever, uh, quick saute, throw that in a mixing bowl with some salad mix and uh, maybe just a little touch of like shredded cheese or, you know, I use like some nonfat sour cream, stir that around, some fresh cut vegetables, you drop that. I actually just make like two large like soft shell uh, tacos with it basically. And it's a really super fast, super healthy, um, you know, weeknight dinner. But I digress. So... If you're going to prep your vegetables, when cooking in a professional environment, or when cooking in general, right, it's almost always do we apply a two-step cooking process because you're always trying to find that perfect balance, that perfect uh, meeting point on the, on the perfection graph of interior texture and exterior doneness, right? You usually on the outside, you want it to be brown or crispy or all the above, right? Because that gives you some great flavor. So steamed green beans are okay, right? When you char them in a hot wok, they're way better, right? Uh, but if you just take raw green beans and you char them in a hot wok or you, or you throw them in a saute pan to brown them, by the time they're brown on the outside, they're gonna have they're gonna be a, a really uh, tough, crunchy uh, interior. So, w what we do is we want to blanch and we want to par cook. And this goes for our our new potatoes. This goes for sweet potatoes. This goes for everything. So, a couple of tricks: your green vegetables. I love one of my favorite kitchen devices or, or tools is a uh, basket steamer. And uh, you know, you can get like the bamboo baskets that you put over a wok, and you can feel really cool about yourself. Because ultimately they, they look cool, right? But they're pretty inconvenient. So I have like the tabletop electric version, double stack basket. Um, just search electric steamer on Amazon. It's a little round thing, has two levels to it. I think it costs like 50 bucks, if not less. And you can steam um, a, quite a bit of vegetables in here. And what's great about uh, steaming vegetables for blanching, right? So when you blanch, you could either blanch in boiling salted water, as we've discussed in previous podcast episodes, and I have uh, some video content on, or you can steam. Now, I much prefer to steam, especially at home, because when you blanch directly in the water, right, the water gets murky and kind of starts uh, having different flavors pretty quick, whereas a steamer, the water's underneath, uh, and you can just kind of load stuff in the basket and go. Also, uh, the steam is more efficient at heat transfer because you don't have the, the product hitting the water and dropping the temp and then that product recovery, right? So if you're, I mean, a really good example of this is hard boiled eggs, right? If you, you know, have the perfect time and temperature for hard boiled eggs at home and you normally make six eggs, right? You bring your pot to a boil, you drop in your, your, your eggs in the shell, uh, you do whatever you set your timer. Some people kill the heat. Doesn't really matter, right? And every single time you you hard boil those six eggs, they come out perfect. Now, what happens when you go to hard boil twelve? Well, you're working in a completely different environment because now you're dropping twelve cold eggs instead of six cold eggs into the same pot, and the temperature drops. It recovers slower or whatever, so it's going to throw off your timing. So your eggs aren't going to be perfect anymore. So the timing is way more consistent. Uh, with blanching your your vegetables, so you can load up your steamer basket after basket. Um, if they're uh, green vegetables, you can have a little uh, bowl of ice sitting there, and uh, you know blanch them, or excuse me, um, ice them to stop the cooking process. Something like a starch, like a, a new potato, um, you just can kind of let cool on the on the counter off to the side. Uh, it's not a big deal. They're not really going to overcook. So I go through this process where I have some vegetables. And I'm steaming them, I'm cooling them, and then I'll just bag them. I'll just bag them in gallon Ziploc bags. And then for my, my salad prep, I'll just bust out my chef's knife, cut up some cucumbers, cut up a, you know maybe a red onion or two, uh, julienne, a little bit of a bell pepper, whatever you like on your salad, right? But this, your salad prep is a good time to practice your knife skills, and I'm bagging those as well. Also, if you guys have watched my um, just my simple uh, roasted red potato video, uh, it's a real straightforward technique where I blanch them in boiling water first, and then cut them in, ha and then you know, let them cool. We cut them in half, toss them in a little bit of oil, and then put them face down on a uh, or cut side down on a sheeted heat tray and roast them. Great, they take about 20 to 25 minutes to roast at that point. 
So that's another good thing. So I'll blanch the new potatoes um, in the uh, steamer until they're tender. And so that's kind of my my prep. That's my workflow. And some of you might be thinking, well, God, that sounds like a lot of work. But it's it's it really isn't. And adjust to your own liking, right? Again, a couple of proteins that are easy to execute that, that, that you can actually cook, right? A couple of maybe salad mixes that you like. Um, and then a starch or two that you can that you can pull into, okay? Um, and, and and this is to get your weeknight meals going. And then for your you know lunches, you can bring leftovers. So I always cook a little bit extra. Um, I can cook for ten. I can cook for one hundred. I can't cook for two. It's just it's it's a, if you put a gun to my head and said, hey, uh, chef, I need you to cook a meal for two with zero leftovers, I'd be like, just fucking pull the trigger. It's it's it's, it's over, Charlie. So. With uh, this prep, now it's time to look at execution. So let's kind of review here. What do I have? Well, I have some salmon, right? That I'm not super excited about, but I know it's a quick pickup and the girls will like it. So that's in the fridge kind of hanging out. I got some salad mixes. I got some uh, some prepped vegetables. Um, I also have a couple of, uh, of steamed vegetables that I blanched. I got my rice, which I can always fire up in the Zojirushi rice cooker. And I have some... Uh, potatoes, uh, some new potatoes that I can roast at any time just by cutting in half, tossing in oil. Now, before we move on to the execution step, another uh, really good trick for my healthy eaters out there is uh, if you eat a lot of uh, sweet potatoes and yams, one of the things that I, my favorite way to, to do this is I take a, you know, a sweet potato or yam, whatever you want, you know, poke a couple holes in it, wrap it in some foil, and roast it in your oven, usually for about an hour and a half, depending on the size. Uh, but, you know, 425, uh, depending on your oven's temperature and how it flows, right? Just kind of watch it. You all know your own ovens. You got to be responsible for your own ovens, right? But for me, 425, an hour and a half, what I'm looking for is when I squeeze that foil on these sweet potatoes, I want it to feel pretty soft, right? Like not completely mush, but like pretty soft because that's gonna get the sweet potato nice and creamy. Then, still in the foil, it goes straight into the fridge. The pickup on this is super simple. I've talked about my flat top griddle that I have. It's a little $13 thing that's an electric griddle that I, I bought from Goodwill, right? And I, uh, I cook a ton of stuff on that. That's where I reheat my meat when I'm making my little soft shell tacos. For the pickup on the sweet potatoes on any given night, so you need a starch, that's healthy. Take your griddle, get it nice and hot, maybe about 350 degrees on the dial, and you take the sweet potato and you just press it directly into this griddle, right? Maybe hit it with some nonstick spray, or you could rub it with uh, some olive oil if you're not counting your fat macros, right? Press that sweet potato right down into the griddle, press it flat, and then let it just sit there and char and hang out. Season with some salt and pepper, and then flip it. By the time both sides are brown, and this is with the skin on, right? By the time both sides are brown, the skin is all is kind of like caramelized and like stuck to the the potato itself. Um, it's heated all the way through, and you got like this kind of crispy exterior, creamy interior, and it's delicious. It's my one of my favorite ways to eat sweet potato, and again, super easy. I'm in my kitchen prepping on the weekend, right? Just rolling potatoes up in, in foil, pop them in my oven that's preheated, set my timer for an hour and a half, grab them, throw them in the fridge, don't even think about them, right? Now it's Wednesday night. I need a quick, healthy starch to go along with my uh, roasted chicken, right? I'm going to just press this down to a flat top. If you don't have a flat top, just use a nonstick pan. Um, if you try and use like a stainless steel pan, you're going to have a bad time. It's just it's going to stick. Press that down. Now, also, too, you could pick them up in your oven as well. So get your oven nice and hot. Uh, you know, spray a sheet pan with some nonstick spray. Flatten these potatoes on your cutting board and then put them onto a sheet tray. Roast until they're crispy. How long? Until they're done. Okay. Uh, there's no magic time. There's only what you're looking for. So just, they're already cooked, right? So we already cooked them to the, we got the internal texture how we want it to be during the prep phase okay so on the pickup we're just looking at getting the exterior texture that we want if you like kind of boring steamed potatoes well then you don't need to do anything you just got to reheat it right uh, me i like a little bit of crispiness a little bit of caramelization on the outside so i pick them up on the flat top or roast them in the oven all right you guys tracking so far okay so, and we'll go through some of your comments here in a, in a second to tie this up. So now I want you to kind of imagine you're hanging out with me on a, on a Monday night or just Tuesday night in my kitchen. I come home from work. I say, ah, let's, let's do a stir fry, right? Let's, uh, you know, let's do a, uh, 
a, a beef stir fry with some green beans and some steamed rice, right? Pretty complete meal, kind of healthy. Well, I have my sliced tri-tip already sitting in the uh, in, in the fridge, right? I got my blanched green beans. So now maybe all I have to do is uh, mince up a little bit of garlic, maybe cut a fresh onion, and I'm good to go. Wok gets hot, I saute my onion, pass it onto the plate, and I actually am, I have a whole video on this I'm getting ready to post for you guys. And then stir fry the meat, go through that stir frying process, the rice is already cooking in the rice cooker. Great thing about the Zojirushi, or any high-end rice cooker, but I have the Zojirushi, is it has that extended hold. So if you're really in a rush for the execution side, I can make that rice in the morning uh, before I go to work, and it'll hold perfectly uh, warm when I get home. So now all I have to do is focus on the actual uh, stir fry and the pickup. So that's a real simple thing, right? Just boom, some green beans, stir fried, meat goes in. Um, after you remove the green beans, stir fry that meat, green beans go back in with the meat, hit it with a little bit of soy, a little bit of uh, chicken stock, uh, and, you're, and you're good to go. And I, I'm going to walk you through this process um, in, a, in a future video. Another night, come home, right? It's salmon night. So salmon, roasted potatoes, uh, and let's do a side salad, okay? So I get my flat top nice and hot. Uh, I get uh, my oven warm. Now, you got to think to yourself, well, of course, these potatoes are going to take the longest time to cook. Uh, so I'm going to turn my oven on first before I do anything. So I got to preheat that oven to 350 or 375. I'm going to throw my sheet pan in there so that gets hot with the oven. And then while the oven's preheating, I'm going to take my potatoes. I'm going to cut them in half. You would be amazed how many people reverse this step, right? They start cutting their potatoes and then they turn on their oven. I mean, like it, when we're sitting here just hanging out, drinking coffee together, a little dribble there, it seems like such an obvious thing. When you're in your kitchen actually cooking, it's not that obvious to people. So you, so you always want to kind of think ahead and say, well, what's going to take the longest? And well, I got to preheat my oven. So you go on, you want to start that stuff first. You, I mean, I can't tell you how many people start reducing their sauce while they're roasting their meat. It's it's too late. It's too late. You're already in the weeds, right? So turn on the oven. Then I start cutting my potatoes in half. Give them a quick toss. I got my griddle preheating. I pull the sheet tray out, throw the potatoes on it, flip them over so they are uh, cut side down. Why? Because I'm a true pro. That's why. And that's, you know, they come out way better that way. Cut side down. They go in the oven. I set my timer for 20 minutes. I start searing the salmon. Sear, 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 sear. Put the salmon on the plate. Oh no, my salmon is done before my potatoes. Oh my God, it's a panic. My salmon's going to be cold. My potatoes are going to be hot. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to do what any chef would do. I'm going to pull the potatoes out. I'm going to season. I'm going to check. I'm going to let my salmon hang out. And I'm not going to turn my oven off, right? When it comes time to serve, hey, uh, girls, dinner time. Boom. Salmon goes in my hot oven, on the plate and everything, right? In the hot oven. Let it sit there for about a minute and a half just to warm up that exterior. And I, uh, I played it. So now we have a, a great dinner of roasted potatoes, salmon, and a, uh, and a side salad. So you can see that by kind of taking this approach as far as prepping out your ingredients, blanching, kind of doing all the, that prep work, what we call mise en place ahead of time, on a, on a Wednesday night, on a Thursday night, you should be stepping in your kitchen and you should be executing. Now, Here's the thing that I can't do for you. I can't stand there in your kitchen, uh, unfortunately, and tell you where you're messing up your execution or where you, where you kind of went wrong on your prep. But here is a mental trick that I'm going to give you right now. If you're in your kitchen on a Thursday night and you're flailing with prep to get something done, well, then that is your feedback that you're not... Uh, prepped out, right? You're in, you're in what we call the weeds. Okay. You're not prepped. So I want you to stop and just kind of take note for a second of what that is. What is that thing? That, what is that item that's putting you in the weeds, right? Is it you're trying to steam your green beans on the fly? Is it you're trying to parboil your potatoes on the fly? What is it that's putting you in the weeds? And then I want you to stop and think about it, right? Just don't don't be a, a bowl in a china shop just kind of powering through everything, right? If something puts you in the weeds, you got to stop and think about it. And that's the execution side. It is kind of mentally preparing yourself or mentally evaluating uh, why something did or, or did not work.
And when you get good enough at this thought process, then you can actually imagine yourself from start to finish cooking a dish in your in your kitchen and executing that dish and and see these sort of nightmarish scenarios. I mean, I'm, well, Thursday nights are going to be not, not a nightmarish, but how many of you, raise your hands, how many of you have had a horrible experience executing something, say on Thanksgiving or Christmas for 12 people, because you, you, you missed a step or you didn't think ahead or you planned poorly, right? So what you need to do is when you get in your kitchen and you feel that confinement of time, you need to ask yourself, why is that? Did I take on too much? Um, am I not properly prepped? And of course, this is all stuff universal from a, a professional perspective as well. So if you're a professional cook li listening to this, same thing. You're hopping on the hotline at, at uh, you know five o'clock at night, dinner service starts, you're scrambling around, you're prepping everything last minute. Where did you mess up? Okay, why aren't why aren't you prepped? Because when it comes time to start cooking, if you're scrambling to get your prep in place, you're you're gonna be screwed, right? You want to focus specifically uh, on execution when the time comes. When the time comes to cook, you want to focus on cooking, all right? And when you get more comfortable with it, uh, you can do what I do, is which is sometimes I'll start roasting meats while I'm slicing stuff and I'm kind of juggling things in, in the in the kitchen. Um, but if you're if you're new to this, if you feel like you're struggling with execution, then you uh, I would plan ahead as much as possible. Now, proteins, as far as cooking ahead, it is possible to do this. Braised meats work the best because you can store your braised meats in the liquid, so you can reheat them in that liquid, and you're not going to lose a whole lot. When you cook proteins ahead, you have what's called warmed-over flavors, and this is why when you uh, go and you get a steak at a restaurant, you bring it home, the next day you reheat it in your microwave, it just doesn't taste the same, kind of has that like, and that's regardless of you overcooking it in your microwave. It's just, it has sort of that kind of stale, almost like waxy flavor to it. That's actually oxidation of the, of the proteins, which happens when you cook proteins and then uh, expose it to oxygen after it cools, and the actual technical term is warmed over flavor. So, that's why a lot of people uh, really like sous vide because sous vide you could actually cook something ahead in a bag uh, and hold it cold and then re-therm it where you're just basically heating the core back up and this whole time you're not breaking the seal uh, on this bag so you're not exposing it to oxygen so it makes the execution um, a lot easier with that said um on a weeknight at my in my home i almost never use sous vide because you got to set up the the pot you gotta set the circulator like it's a whole thing and i just find myself not using sous vide less and less at home I, I never really used it much in the first place um in my home kitchen uh in fact the thing that that i use my sous vide for the most is to defrost things you know you come home you're you're kind of in a rush oh shit i forgot to pull that thing out of the fridge right so i'm gonna set up a pot i'm gonna set my immersion circulator to you know 80 degrees fahrenheit right, which is just a little bit above, uh, you know, a warm room temperature, drop in whatever frozen in about 10 to 15 minutes, it'll be perfectly thawed uh, without sort of that weird, like partial cooking thing that happens if you try and do the defrost uh, cycle um, on your microwave. Now, once you get down this, this, uh, this prep flow, right, uh, on a semi weekly basis, you're going to start getting into a rhythm and you're going to start kind of finding your sweet spot and what you like. And you're going to almost start creating your own menu. And now you want to start looking at having some revolving items. You're not cooking the same thing every single week, but maybe you got like eight to 10 revolving items that you're really good at. And you, and you realize like, Hey, I can prep my lasagna ahead of time and then bake it night of, right? I can blanch these veggies. I really like broccoli. I really like green beans. I can stir fry. I can saute. I really like these meats. These are the marinades that I like. So you start getting in this prep flow. You start figuring out what your family likes, um, and you and, and you the and that's another thing too, right? Uh, <clears throat> I think we've discussed this before, but it it bears to mention again. Home home cooks tend to have ADD. They cook a recipe once and they want to do another recipe. They cook a recipe once. Oh, I do not want to exit. Uh oh. Let's see. Saying my connection went offline. Oh, come on now. I was on such a flow too. There we go. All right. Sorry for that momentary interruption. So <clears throat> you were 
you basically you cook a recipe once, you move on, you know, and you all you're always you're not ever getting those reps, right? The more you cook the same item or the same recipe, the better you're going to get it. The more refined it'll become, the more easy it'll become to execute, right? And this is why I always tell somebody, um, don't try and do something new on Thanksgiving when you're having, you know, 12 people over, right? That's not the time to try out your newest turkey recipe. That's not the time to try out your newest side recipe. You got you to gotta try that stuff out when people aren't around, right? And you're not under that pressure of execution. Also, everyone is so afraid to fail in the kitchen. Uh, like, God forbid you throw something away, right? This week I did a, 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 a slow roasted uh, tri-tip in the combi oven, and I got so close because I, I was doing this whole thing. Maybe we'll get into it later of, like, how I was programming, and I had, like, 12 different stages. And the tri-tip ended up, like, okay, but it wasn't great, right? Why? Because I was messing around. I was trying to do something. I was trying to run my combi oven through a process that nobody else was doing, right? There's no documentation on it online, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm paving a new path. If you want to do interesting food, if you want to do interesting concepts, if you want to grow uh, your, your culinary repertoire as, as a chef, right, you, you got to be comfortable with throwing shit in the trash every now and then. I, you know, in one of these um, questions that I got on Facebook in the podcast thread, they said, tell me about one of your saves. Or, or like, like, what's your best save? And I think what they were looking for was, you know, maybe like I messed up a soup and it was too salty. Oh no! So I saved the soup by throwing in chunks of raw potato, which doesn't work, by the way. And uh, you know, I, I I saved the day. Right? Here is how you save the day. You don't serve it. You throw it in the trash. And because you have other stuff prepped, because you're properly prepped out, and because you know how to hustle, you're able to scramble. And, and get something else on the table um, in time. And there's been a couple of times where I'm cooking at, I'm a professional chef cooking at home for my wife and my daughter. And I turned around, I'm like, ah, fuck, it's, uh, well, girls, looks, looks like it's going to be pizza night. Yeah, I was trying out something new, right? Totally screwed it up. Inedible, right? Ah, pizza night, girls. Let's go get some pizza. Sometimes that's just how it plays out. Now, that's not what you want to get happen again when you're hosting a Super Bowl party, right? You want to bring out your greatest hits, but your entire week, or excuse me, your entire year, you're working on these greatest hits, you're in your kitchen, you're playing, um, and you know, you're, not, uh, you're not afraid of, uh, of failure. So let's look at your comments here. Hmm... So how many days those steamed and blanched veggies last in the fridge? Uh, three to five, at least five. It dep everyone's fridge is, is, is different, but um, assuming that you blanch them properly, you don't overcook them, right? They're just par cooked. Uh, they're going to last five days in the fridge. Um, all of my marinades that I do last easily five days, right? So it's going to get you through to the next the next weekend. If, you, uh, if your marinades are too salty, um, you're going to have uh, issues with basically items becoming like o over brined at that point. So, you know, watch the salt content on your marinades, but like the alkaline marinades I do for my stir fries, um, you know, throw, throw it in the fridge. Um, I can pull that, uh, stir fry meat five days later and it just gets better and better each day. It just gets more and more tender. Um, Speaking of making hard-boiled eggs to get started, what's a good time to steam? You're looking at probably um, I don't know, 13 minutes, but I'm at altitude too, so your mileage may vary. Um, let's see. What veggies need blanching? That's a good question. So basically any, any vegetable um, that is too crunchy for your taste. Right, so it's, it's it's all subjective. So again, the whole blanching process with with green vegetables, it's partially to set the green color, right? So they don't look like drab and, and gray. So it kind of brightens up the color. Uh, but more importantly, it's because however your whatever your secondary cook is, right? Your sautéing, your stir frying, your roasting, it's generally not going to be enough to get the interior texture that you want. If you like really sort of crispy and 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 waxy green beans. Uh, then you're then you're 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 gonna have a um, 
then you can just skip the whole blanching step and, and go from there. All right. If uh, you like them a little more tender, you can just go ahead and, and blanch them. So let's see. Subi rack of lamb. Subi rack of lamb was perfect for Christmas. I didn't have to spend all day in the kitchen. All right. Very, very nice. Um, all right. Some people are. So we had a little hiccup there with the live stream. So live stream is is still up. I'm still going. I think. And if not, we may just have to continue without everybody. We might just have to forge ahead. But it looks like my live stream feed uh, got dropped. And I got a couple of... Oh, well, looks like I lost all my viewers, and I was on a roll. Okay. That's okay. We're going to punt here. Now, along the, those same lines of, uh, of being scared to fail, one of the things that uh, some of you know that, that I'm into is I am a, a big fan. So, so just... Uh, Last weekend, I got promoted to purple belt in uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is something that uh, uh, took me seven years to do. Probably like five years of a active training, uh, but seven years to, to accomplish. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because it's hard to separate the mentality of somebody who does Jiu-Jitsu and somebody who is successful in a uh, professional kitchen. The great thing, or just a, fresh, you know, just a good cook, the great thing about jiu-jitsu is every single day that you train you have a chance to fail at something multiple times and you have a chance to be put in a position that really really sucks okay and you have to work your way out of it and and this is something that i feel more and more people are unwilling to do, right? They're unwilling to put themselves in a position of failure. Uh, they're unwilling to um, be bad at something. They try something once, maybe twice, and they think to themselves, oh God, I'm not good at this. I'm not good at this cooking thing. I'm not good at this knife skills thing. I can never hold my knife properly. And because of that, they just give up. And what something like, Jiu-Jitsu, which is a very technical um, art to learn, what something like Jiu-Jitsu will uh, teach you on a daily basis is that it's okay to be bad at something and it takes hundreds and hundreds of tries uh, to get good at something. So with that said, we are going to pause here for a second and... No streaming on any format, be it Wi-Fi or 4G. Okay. So we're going to pause for a second. We're going to try and get our live stream back up. We are back live. Hello, Colin. Hello, Monty. Hello, Quant. All right. The show uh, must go on. You know, and that's that's the problem. I, I really wanted to just dump the Facebook live stream because of how they handle the comments. So if I miss your comment, please post it in our Discord uh, channel, which I will post in uh, the link. Okay. And uh, we'll go from there. Hi, Bart. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. All right. So any questions on uh, meal prep and execution before we move on? Uh, I think we could put a pretty nice bow on that. So again, just get your workflow going. Don't bite off more than you can chew. No pun intended, really. Uh, just a common cliche phrase. But, uh, you know, just go in your kitchen and have fun. If you traumatize yourself, uh, you're not going to have fun. You're going to have, uh, you know, culinary PTSD. And it's, it's, it's just going to build and build and build over time. So start small. Start small and, and, and work your way towards it. Okay. So now we are going to go through your um, some of your, your postings 
and some emails that I got, and I'm going to try and juggle this whole thing all at once with the Discord and your Facebook questions, and to just kind of see uh, how it all goes. So let's do a quick lightning round. Uh, dry brining, why or why not? Uh, people like to do dry brining because they feel that it's uh, easier, which it is. You don't have to have a big uh, container of water. Um, but also, too, some people feel it dilutes the flavor by adding water to your meat. I disagree with that, but uh, basically it comes down to personal uh, taste. Let's see what else we got here. We're going to skip over that one for a second. Execution. Converting regular sous vide recipes to combi oven recipes and uh, holding temps. Um, the combi oven kind of holds true for the most part. Do you guys want a combi oven update? Let me know in the, in the comments if you want a combi oven update. But for the most part, it uh, the sous vide temps hold true. Where you where you miss the combi oven a little bit is the fact that the, the heat transfer isn't quite as exact. So what I've found works well. If I want to cook something at like 140, I'll set the combi oven to like 145. Stick the probe in whatever it is I'm cooking. Let it climb to 140 and then have the, the program automatically jump the oven temperature. Uh, down to 140 again. That's going to give you the, the best sort of sous vide results on that. Um, what else? Next steps after culinary boot camp, just go be a culinary badass. Right? Uh, you got the flavor structure, you got the technique, you got the execution, but really it's just uh, working through those concepts. Now, I do have some more course material planned to sort of, sort of add on to the, uh, the culinary boot camp later on. Um, but yeah, it's just it's, it's putting those, those items into action. Um, when the live stream went down, you, you may or may not have uh, heard this portion where I was talking about the importance of, uh, for me at least, of doing jujitsu because you're constantly just being bad at something every single day, right? So uh, you can, you know, for me, right, like the instructor can show me how to do a specific move or a specific choke, but it takes just reps and reps and reps. So you can understand the concepts of flavor structure and technique and sauce making and execution, um, but once you finish the the boot camp curriculum, you got to get into your kitchen and uh, and start doing those reps. So rep after rep after rep after rep is the uh, the only way to to really uh, get better and try and focus on um, on on doing the same sort of handful of techniques over and over and over again until you you feel like you've mastered them. I saw your uh, sous vide, oh, your your video regarding converting a bread recipe using commercial yeast, a sourdough. How about the reverse, a sourdough to yeast? Why the hell would you ever want to do that? Gross. No, just kidding. So for the most part, to get a uh, a two hour rise, or a, a two to four hour rise, or a um, with a uh, one to two hour um, proof. For every thousand grams of flour that your recipe calls for, you're going to need four to seven grams of active dry yeast, and it uh, it really is that simple. Oh, here's a good one: how high-end restaurants decide about their menu, uh, or extend this: how a good promising restaurant should decide about the menu. Um, so, how can you decide for a menu when the reality is? Uh, that most of your clients uh, don't know how to appreciate this because I was kind of cutting out the comments. But basically, what's you know how do you find that balance as as a chef uh, to do the kind of food that that you want to do? And it's it's always going to be a a building process. Now, it's easy to blame this um, on your guests and say, "Oh, they just they don't understand me. They don't get me. They don't understand how." Uh, how great my my food is, how creative I am, right? But you're basically blinding yourself by by your own ego. You have to earn their trust. Now, I love great creative food, okay? But when I walk into a, a, a restaurant and I don't know the chef, there's not a whole lot of buzz, and uh, you know, I'm sitting down for dinner, I'm probably going to go for something safe, Right. I mean, unless unless there's a reason, unless you can entice me out of the safe 
bet. As a professional chef, just as a normal diner, I'm going to go with something safe, right? Because I don't want to deal with that shit, okay? Uh, you got to earn my trust. So you got to build a reputation. And the way that you build a reputation is by uh, executing your menu flawlessly time and time and time again and getting everybody to trust in you, not only the customers, but also the servers and your staff and your kitchen crew, right? How many times have you been to a restaurant and you ask a server, like, hey, uh, how's this dish? And they're like, eh, the halibut's really good. And you're like, okay, okay, I can read between the lines, right? So, for example, when I was opening up Stella way back in the day, it started off really simple. You know, just doing some simple meat and veg sets, right? But I was pan roasting the chicken breast perfectly. I was brining it. I was getting some nice veg sets underneath it. Um, you know, I was doing you know the nice reduction sauces. And the menu description would read uh, something as simple as, you know, pan roasted chicken breast, uh, sautéed zucchini and squash with garlic and thyme, and a uh, you know roasted chicken velouté. Sounds nice, right? But also not really intimidating to, to, to most people. Uh, or you, you can even do like a roasted chicken jus. So you got to write your menu to your audience. And then as you start to, to build that base, right, you can start pushing the envelope a little bit. And that's, and that's what your specials are for, right? So you're pushing the envelope um, on your specials. And you're you're becoming more and more creative, and people they order the specials, and your staff is fired up because they're selling the specials, and they're maybe they're making some more money. So the specials are a good sort of feedback loop for new dishes. All right, they're not to blow out waste. They're not to blow out uh, you know a product that's kind of getting ready to turn in your in your walk-in. They're for you to to experiment to try and get uh, new people on on board uh, with your overall cuisine and your and your and your cooking style and then what's going to happen is if you do it right you're slowly going to evolve into a menu that is purely you right and it's going to have all i mean every single menu item is going to have your greatest hits um, and maybe a couple of you know escape hatches for people all right unless you're doing like a pure high-end fine dining concept where everyone's coming in and getting like a, a set tasting menu you got to give some people some outs, right? Because you're going to have a four top that comes in and, and you know, three of them are going to be foodies, but the, the fifth guy just wants a steak and wants like a salad. Okay. Not a big deal. It has nothing to do with you. Don't let your ego get involved. So have some outs for these people. All right. Don't force them um, to, to just take a leap of faith on, on every single item. So it's a, it's a long, slow process, but it's on you as the chef to execute, to, to have an opening menu that you can execute. And this is where a lot of people fail. They take over a restaurant and they want to make a bang or they open a restaurant and they want to make a bang, right? So what they do is they write this beautiful menu and it has all these geeky culinary phrases on it. And they, they get in the kitchen with a green team um, that doesn't have a whole lot of training and they completely just drop the ball. They can't execute. The chef might have some amazing dishes, but if you can't execute, then you ain't shit. All right. That's just how it, it happens. So what you want to do is you want, I mean, who doesn't like a perfectly pan roasted chicken breast with some vegetables? I love it. Who doesn't like a perfectly pan roasted steak with some solid mashed potatoes and a demi gloss? I love it. It's great. It's good stuff. Now, is it uh, pushing the, the culinary envelope? No. But if you can start by flawlessly executing these items, and then go from there, use it as a base, as a foundation to earn trust. Then when that guy comes back for that third time for a filet with your demi gloss, the server's going to say, hey, you know what, Mr. Smith? You know what you really ought to try is you got to try this guy's pan roasted duck breast. It is out of the world, right? Because your servers truly believe in it. And it's way easier to sell a product that you believe in. Now, if you're opening up with this amazing menu, well, you better have good funding and you better have a reputation right? If you're some no-name chef and you think that you're just going to open up a restaurant with like a, a, a super creative menu from day one, it's it, it's not going to happen. Okay. You got to have a reputation. You got to give people a reason to trust you. 
And it's also going to take a ton of training to get these people up to speed. You, these people, I mean, your kitchen, right? So you're going to have to be cooking and throwing stuff away, cooking and throwing stuff away, because you can only eat so many, so much food amongst your kitchen staff and your front of the house, right? And you're going to have to invest in weeks and weeks and weeks of training, probably six to eight weeks of in the kitchen training, not serving any staff or excuse me, not serving any customers, right? Because that's what's going to take to get people up to speed or your your, your kitchen up to speed with these sort of uh, high-end uh, tasting menu concepts. So they're very expensive to launch. So the best thing to do if you don't have a ton of money to burn and you don't have a massive reputation is you ease your way into that, right? You get a good solid opening team, you start working on the basics with them, and the basics will rapidly become um, more and more advanced dishes, right? Um, Let's assume I have dinner at a nice restaurant such as yours. You have a bad experience, poor waiter, overcooked, undercooked food. Uh, how should I as a diner approach the situation and what should we expect as a remedy? That's a great question. Just tell somebody. Tell I mean, if you um it in a in a well run restaurant, it should be obvious who's in charge. Okay? So you should walk in, um, if if it if you can't really spot a front of the house manager, right, then you're going to be in, pro in, in, in trouble. In, in my restaurant, you can easily tell the, the, uh, the front of the house manager because they wear a different uniform and they just carry themselves with presence. And also, too, we have an open kitchen that you, could, you can literally walk up to where I'm standing or where one of my chefs is standing on, a, on any given night. And you can say, hey, chef, uh, let me tell you something, right? Like the, the experience wasn't so good, right? And also, too... In a higher end restaurant, um, it's not always possible, but the chef should be working the dining room to a certain extent. Okay, a lot of times I end up in the kitchen because I'm busy, right? Um, and so that's not always a possibility. But when you have a chance, when you have a break in the action, if you're a chef, uh, you should go touch the tables and check in with your guests and, and get feedback because ultimately uh, you want to get them before they walk out of the door and uh, and never return. Most people, when they have an issue, are very reasonable, right? Um, they just they want to be heard. They want a little bit of empathy, um, and and that's it. A lot of times we're not even looking for free shit, right? And I'll I'll comp them stuff because my my philosophy has always been, hey, look at all, you know. And, and sometimes people get offended. Oh no, no no, that's not what I was going for. It's not what I was, you know. I wasn't looking for something free. I just wanted to make sure that that you knew that that this wasn't really right, and I you know I just want to bring it to your attention. And a really good way to diffuse that one of my go-to lines is, hey, look it, don't worry about it. Uh, I'll gladly charge you full price when it's correct, right? But if it's not correct, you're not going to pay for it. That's just, that's that's how we do things here. Um, so, you know, thank you so much for bringing it to my attention. Um, you know, we're going to take that off your bill. And uh, if, if you don't mind, I'd love to drop you some desserts. I'd like to buy you a glass of wine or whatever it is, right? You, you kind of read the table, you read the situation. So if you're in a truly upscale restaurant or environment, uh, and you raise your hand and, and and say, hey, you know, to the the, the floor manager, to the chef, um, hey, it just this didn't really seem right. Um, then they they should fix it, and your expectation of them fixing it at the very least should be an apology. But if you don't like something, they should take it off the bill. Now, also too, people are just uncomfortable sometimes complaining in a restaurant, and that's the frustration that uh, chefs and restaurant tours have with Yelp right? Because what happens is it's really easy to be a, a tough guy and, you know, on, on Antoine Ego, right, the, from Ratatouille, sort of like that shitty sort of food critic. It's really easy to be that tough guy behind the computer screen where you're not looking somebody in the eye and typing out this really shitty negative review, right? But at the end of the day, we're like, we're human beings that put our heart and soul into this stuff, right? Like, it's, 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 not, it's not easy, and, 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 and all that we normally want you to do is just give us a chance to make it right. Now, if you bring it to their attention and they don't make it right, okay, then by all means, go and roast them on social media, go and post a bad Yelp review. But I think, but there's been, you know, and, and I, I don't like to complain in restaurants personally, me, right? Because as a, as a chef, so because people that I'm eating with, right, they know what I do for a living. And I don't want to be like, oh God, we can't go to, we can't, I, I mean, it's already bad enough where, where people don't want to cook for me. And I love great home cooked meals, right? But like people don't want to 
you know, invite me over to their home and cook for me because they're intimidated. But you, you make me a killer like tuna noodle casserole, I'm so fucking happy, right? So same thing with going out to restaurants. When I'm sitting, when I'm sitting down with people at a, at a table, I don't want them to be like, oh god, like we got to go and eat with Jacob, or he's going to just critique every little thing. No, uh, uh-uh. I'm off the clock. I'm there to eat, and also too, as a professional in a kitchen, I'm probably one of the most empathetic people that you can get in your restaurant there's been multiple times where you know i'm at a table and maybe my you know the service isn't going that good and you know my my dining companions are getting a little bit frustrated and i'll 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 look at them and say hey guys like look like they are they're slammed right now like look at this poor server over here she looks brand new right she is so far in the weeds right now do you guys know what it's like to be in the weeds on a saturday night she's losing her mind right now in in the kitchen they're they're back and they're behind right it's like like just Guys, let's order. Let's order another round of drinks. Let's just let's chill, okay? Let's let's just give them a chance to to catch up. Now, with that being said, uh, because I would never charge somebody for something that they didn't like, right? I myself won't pay for something that I don't like, and it's real simple. And and a lot of times you don't even have to you don't have to explain yourself. You don't have to critique their dish. You you call them over and say, hey, are, are you the manager or even the server? I mean, usually the server should know, okay? Hey, I just want to let you know, like. The steak just wasn't really my thing, right? Oh, can I get you something else? Yeah, I'd like to get the chicken. Or, you know, actually, at this point, I'm, I'm okay. I think I'm just going to jump straight to dessert, but I just wasn't a big fan of the steak or eggs or fill in the blank, right? They should automatically drop that from your check, right? They're, that's what they're trained to do. Now, if that doesn't happen, well, then they're, you know, you're probably not in a very well-ran establishment and you just don't patronize them anymore, right? That's kind of how it goes. Um... What do you think uh, about starting out in a food truck? I'm, I mean, sure, right? You can start wherever. I mean, there's everyone sees those success stories of guys that start in a food truck because the overhead is is really uh, cheap. And then, of course, you had that one uh, movie that came out a while ago. It's all like the uh, food truck craze. Um, so you can, but it's it's also like you know, what do you, you know, what do you want to do for for a living? What do you want to do for your life? It's um, there's different avenues to to progress in a professional kitchen. Um, there's different ways to to you know grow your your career. Uh, for me, I, I don't find working in a food truck uh, appealing at all. Um, <laughs> the professional kitchens are already uh, so small. Um, but for somebody who's like, ah, fuck the man, I'm sick of going and working for this asshole. I'm just gonna go and buy a food truck and drive it around town and and start my own thing and. You know, some people are successful at that, uh, but it's a lot harder than you think. There's a lot of regulations that go along with it. You got to find uh, areas where people allow you to park, um, and and now because they're becoming more and more of a thing, uh, you have things like food truck parks, which make things easier. But that also means uh, that you now have more competition. But at the end of the day, when it comes to um, actually running your own food based business, right, you always see people that want to have their gimmicks and their sticks, and this is going to be our angle, right? The best gimmick, stick, and angle to have is quality. And it seems kind of like, you know, well, duh, chef. But like, you, I mean, I can't tell you how many p- people will, will, will tell me, hey, you know, we should really open up a restaurant that does X in this neighborhood because that restaurant doesn't have X and we should serve like these kind of dishes. Uh, and it, it from a, a traditional business standpoint, it kind of makes sense. But it's like, how about you just cook the fucking food that you want to cook and you just do it the best? Right, you, you you roll into a restaurant and say, "Hey, everyone, what's up, guys? I'm new in town. I cook really good food. You want to come and have some?" Right? Uh, that's that's always been my approach. So when you compete on on quality, um, you don't really need a shtick. Okay. Um, I agree with your issue on Yelp. Uh, still found some great food via Yelp. Sort of a double edged sword. Uh, yeah, you know, and that's the thing is, is when I'm in a new city, right, I'm looking around for stuff, Yelp isn't a bad place to find some, some new, um, some new uh, places to go and eat. And over time, the, the, the averages tend to be fairly true, right? If, uh, if a restaurant has like a four star or above average, they're probably pretty, pretty solid. Okay. If they have like a three star average, eh, 
they, they might be hit and miss. You might want to dig a little bit deeper. Maybe now their more recent reviews are, are better because they had a change of chef or a change of ownership or, or something. Um, it's more just the frustration of it's really easy uh, to tear something down. It's really hard to build something. And when you're building something, when you're cooking something, you're putting your heart and soul into it. Um, and it's incredibly difficult not to take that personally. Over years, with lots and lots of practice, I have learned uh, not to take it personally because it just is what it is. You, you look for, I mean, sometimes people just have a bone to pick with you. Sometimes people uh, want to pretend like they're the next uh, up and coming food critic. And it's way easier to be funny and compelling when you're negative, right? It's a lot harder to do uh, compelling content that's positive. People just kind of, it's just easier, right? I mean, just kind of just think about that for a second. It's a lot easier to do compelling and funny and um, people love to read a story about a good shit show. So you can, uh, you know, be hyperbolic and really kind of, you know, drive that point home. Everyone gives you a bunch of likes and thumbs up because, you know, again, like people like to slow down on, on the freeway to watch a car crash. And, and so you start this feedback loop where maybe people be like, being a little bit harsher than is necessary. And I think sometimes people forget that, that there's a real fucking human being behind that, Right. Like there's like that was a real person that brought you your food, and uh, you know maybe they were being a little you know you thought they were rude or maybe you thought they were standoffish or whatever, but what what do you think was going on in their life, right? Do they just get some really bad news? Uh, are they working a a triple so they can make ends meet, right? Uh, do they hate uh, wearing a mask for eight hours a day and they're just and it's hard to smile through the mask and that's, uh, there's all sorts so. A little bit of empathy and everything goes goes a long way, right? Not just uh, uh, the the food business. I think uh, people in general could be a little bit more empathetic and understanding of uh, of one another. Okay, let's see how are we doing on time here. So I think we're gonna have to most likely uh, punt some of our other topics. To next week, I'm just kind of checking my notes here. See if there's something that uh, we can nail down really quick. I, ha I had one email come in asking me, uh, "Oh, it's from Monty. What's up, Monty?" So Monty was asking me about uh, wine pairings and the value of wine pairings, and of course they're they're important. So a real quick sort of way to um, to do uh, beverage pairings and wine pairings is when you eat food or when you drink a beverage, think to yourself, "What is this missing?" and then supplement with that, right? Um, so if you're, if you drink like a, a glass of wine and also too, what is this wine reminder? What are their flavors, right? If you're tasting blueberries in the wine, then maybe you want to add some blueberries in the dish. If you're tasting sort of some mushrooms, umami, earthiness in the wine, maybe you want to add that to the dish. Um, so just, it's kind of a, a back and forth and, and you can get really creative with your wine pairings by not knowing too much about wine. You just kind of accidentally stumble on top of things because you say, hey, you know, when I drink this wine, I instantly think of that. And, 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 and trust your gut on that. Now, also, too, you can use the wine to balance out uh, flavors in the food or vice versa. And there's certain times when I'm doing like more advanced wine pairings where I will specifically, if I know that everyone who's having this meal is going to be drinking wine, I will specifically leave a gap in the flavor structure uh, in my food that'll be filled by the wine. So now the wine is actually being uh, incorporated as, as a part of your dish. Some of the biggest mistakes that people make, uh, one of the biggest ones is never serve anything overly spicy or peppery with wine, especially red wines. The tannins in red wines play off of the capsaicin um, in spicy food and absolutely just destroys the wine. Uh, nothing will make a, a, a high-end wine drinker more angry uh, than an overly spiced dish or a spicy dish when trying to drink a nice Cabernet. Now, if you are going to be serving a spicy dish, you want to have a, a off-dry wine or a slightly sweet wine to balance the spice in that dish, and it'll hold up to it. So, um, you know, like a... Um, Moscato di Asti, and if, if you're, uh, I, I do like a this albacore dish with some uh, hot curry, so it's a sliced rare albacore uh, with like a hot red curry, kind of a play on a Thai curry, but I do it as, as part of a tasting menu option, and uh, I always like to serve it with a little bit of a Moscato di Asti, there's a little bit of effervescence, some, some bubbly, right, and then you get um, that sweetness to help balance out uh, the actual heat of, of the wine. All right. Um, some questions about food allergies coming in. There was one about, um, 
you know, some people just basically trying to figure out how to replicate items. So, you know, alternative flowers, how to cook without dairy. So in previous uh, conversations, we were talking about active ingredients versus flavor ingredients, right? So is your ingredient that you're, that you're removing, is it actively doing something or is it just there for, for flavor? So in the, the best way to tackle something like that is to understand the base recipe. If you want to be a really good gluten-free bread baker, you have to first understand how to bake traditional bread or at least understand the science behind gluten and gluten structure and how that gluten structure affects your overall dough. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to replicate something that doesn't exist, right? You're trying to do a gluten-free bread uh, with, uh, you know, like coconut flour, almond flour, whatever it is. So you're trying to replicate gluten structure um, but if you don't understand what gluten structure actually is, then you have a hard time replicating it. So what you want to do is you want to actually study whatever that base is. If you're uh, trying to do like dairy-free desserts, you need to understand how, like what is the science behind cream in a dessert? What actually makes that cream whip? What makes it stable? And and then once you understand those components, then you can start swapping out um, you know, different components and, and, and testing and seeing what works. The good news is, is the world is becoming a smaller and smaller place with all these different online communities. And if you're a dairy-free cook, if you're a gluten-free cook, um, there's a community out there uh, that has what you're looking for. Now, unfortunately, and, and, and you know, this, I, I hope this doesn't offend my gluten-free and, and dairy-free friends. And if, if it does, then you're just being too sensitive. But when you cook with dietary restrictions in mind, the the flavor and the outcome of your food is almost always secondary, right? You're, you're just kind of willing to accept the fact that your bread's never going to be as good uh, again because you, you can't use gluten, right? But when you develop skills, when you develop universal skills as a chef that we talk about constantly on this podcast, like flavor structure and technique and execution, and then you bring that to a diet-restricted uh, cooking approach, you're going to have the, the best of both worlds. So if you un understand flavor, so uh, for example, right, say you're completely vegan and you, and you want to uh, learn how to cook vegan foods. If you're not watching how, uh, how guys barbecue meats, uh, how uh, different chefs will marinate their meats and char them and put them on the grill, then you're never fully going to understand how to replicate that flavor that, that the people that you're serving uh, are, are missing, right? Because you might just be stuck in this vegan echo chamber, right? Uh, and if you if all you ever do is barbecue and grill meats and all you're ever looking at is a barbecue and grilled meat videos, you're not looking at other videos and diversifying the information that's coming in, then you're always going to be kind of stuck in that rut and you don't know what you don't know, okay? So um, for all the dietary stuff, step one, go and find a good community, that is uh, familiar with with solving these problems, and then step two, when you're trying to nail a a specific recipe, research that recipe, understand what the active ingredients are uh, versus the uh, the the actual just flavor components, right? So ingredients that only add flavor. Um, so for example, if something like um, like brioche, right? You're making brioche the uh, the butter in the brioche is an active flavor, uh, but it's also an active ingredient. So it's a flavor and active ingredient because the fat in the butter is what helps to keep that uh, that brioche soft. But is that your only option as a fat? Can you find other dairy-free fats? Yeah, of course you can. So go and find a dairy-free fat. However, uh, the, the oil, uh, which is liquid at room temperature, is going to affect your dough differently. Uh, then butter, which is uh, you know semi soft but not completely liquid and melted at room temperature, so the, the texture of your dough is going to be different. So now you got to start troubleshooting that. Um, and the thing is, is, is you could do a whole podcast episode on just how to convert brioche to gluten free, or how to convert um, you know uh, this dessert to dairy free, right? So what you need to do is you need to go and do the research behind a specific dessert and understand that there's not one silver bullet. Right, that's going to solve all of your dairy-free problems, all of your gluten-free problems, all of your vegan problems. But you'll start to pick up these little tips and tricks along the way. And as you you know, you know, solve one dish, you move on to the next, you solve another dish, you move on to the next, and you start building a repertoire. Right? If you have, 
I mean, every single like if you want to be considered a great cook uh, among your family and friends, like if you have like twelve solid recipes that you can just nail, blindfolded, just just wake up at six a.m. in the morning, right, kind of fuzzy in the eyes, right, that you can just nail, then you're then you're gonna be set, right? What happens is people again, like we talked about earlier, they get ADD cooking, right? They're just kind of constantly distracted by the new shiny thing, the new technique, the new this, the new that, right? And they're constantly chasing down like what's next, what's next, what's next. So they're not focusing on a, a singular dish. So when you focus um, on that singular dish and perfect that dish, right? Over time, it's it's a long term game plan, right? No one gets great at anything overnight. So you got to build your your catalog of, of great dishes. So you want to have, you know, twelve and 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 that's twelve all in, right? If you have say uh, four mains, four starters, that's eight, okay, and. Uh, four desserts and not even so four mains four starters uh you know two other whatevers and then two solid desserts okay you can blow people's minds with that uh for years and then you just start doing variations on the stuff so you start you start realizing well this solid chicken dish that i do i can do that with goose and i can do that with duck and i can do it with, with quail i can really do it with any poultry right it's all kind of kind of universal and and this amazing tri-tip dish that i do well i could easily do that with a with a ribeye or i could do it with a you know beef tenderloin right so you start kind of interchanging things and you have like this base of of 12 solid dishes that you know from like just you know them in your soul and you can execute at any moment and then you just start swapping out ingredients and you start kind of just you know building on top of that and you start doing these different variations so you're not reinventing the wheel every single time but as you swap out ingredients you're creating new dishes all right um Hey, chef, isn't it risky to leave out a taste sensation that will be supplied by the wine? Your dish by itself will not be balanced. Yeah, it is risky, right? But uh, you got to take risks. You got to have some balls if you want to. And I mean that uh, you, you know, euphemistically, right? Um, uh, you got to have, uh, you know, some some guts to go out and, uh, you know, to, to, to blow people's minds. Now, if you do that with every single dish, you're doing like a seven-course tasting menu um, with... Uh, where every single dish is missing something, and and you want the wine to complement it, then it's it's gonna it's, you're, you're you're taking too big of a risk. But you want to blow people's minds, okay? You want to blow people's minds, right? Um, a a really a, a good example of this. Well, let me see. I mean, one of my favorite examples is just the Moscato di Asti that acts as a you know the sweetness acts as a cooling agent for the the curry so you maybe leave your curry a little bit unbalanced right and it's it's the same sort of concept that we talk about um in when we, in ethos for flavor we start talking about leaving um these little pockets uh, on the plate right so your your flavor interruption so you want to keep things interesting you don't want things to be too homogenous because the a homogenous tasting stuff uh gets boring okay so it, yeah you, if you're doing a seven course wine pairing uh, do you want to leave a, a gap in every single dish? No. But also, too, at that level, it comes with commentary. If you're not giving a blow-by-blow, blow, if you're not selling each dish and each pairing, uh, then you may as well just stay home, right? So when I do a wine dinner or when I do a tasting menu, or even so if I can't be at that table, right, if we're, it's like a New Year's Eve night, we're doing a tasting menu with a wine pairing, we're training the servers on what the wine is and why it goes with that dish. So now they're pre-selling it. When they're describing that pairing, they're putting it in their head. You want to blow people's minds. You say, yeah, you notice how this dish is a, is a little bit, um, you know, it's going to be a little bit under-seasoned, right? But because, uh, you know, this comes from the coast and there's some salinity in the wine, You'll notice that when you take a sip, it kind of adds that that salinity, that saltiness to this dish that you're that you're missing, and people's just eyes just they, they light up and they sparkle because most people don't really truly understand wine pairing. So when you give them these opportunities to explore how food interacts with wine and how wine will interact with food and how those uh, interplay with each other, then you really start. Uh, taking things to the next level and blowing people's minds. Okay, so I guess the overall point is more so. You know, give people the opportunity to discover uh, 
what food and wine can do together, how they can play off of one another, and explain to them what you're going for. You got to give them a blow by blow. Uh, in a larger restaurant setting, you got to train your servers to do it. If you're doing like a, a, a wine tasting menu at home, then you got to be prepared to tell people, hey, this is the wine that I selected for this dish, uh, and here's why. Um, let's see. Oh, thanks, Quat. Quat is the shit. Quat Molo, thank you so much. Um, she's uh, kind of getting all the comments straight. Um, <laughs> new billboard idea for the restaurant. Stella has balls. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, meatballs. So, um, she's dropping into the chat here some questions uh, that I missed. So, speaking of masks, what has been the challenge of our COVID world from your perspective? The hospitality industry has been getting killed. Um, by the way, I have to give a shout out to Dave Portnoy of Barstool. Yeah, so Dave Portnoy, um, Chef Andrew Gruel, um, he's been doing a, a fund for uh, restaurant people. And our, our, our boy Guy Fieri, Frosted Tips, Lamborghini, right? He stepped up to the plate. And that's the thing. The uh, restaurant community really came together uh, for each other uh, during this whole thing. And it, it's been it's been tough. Um, and it's not over yet. It's been a... Um, a long, a long slog, um, you know, and it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's hard to talk about, right? Because, so here's the thing, I am, as, as a leader, as somebody who uh, leads a team of individuals um, for a living, um, I know that uh, sometimes I just have to make a decision and there's going to be some people that are pissed off at me uh, and there's going to be some people that are happy with me, right? And in that moment, I got to take all the data points that I have and I have to make a decision. Um, and sometimes I get it right. Um, hopefully more times than not, uh, I get it right. Other times I get it wrong, right? But that's what they pay me to do. At a certain point, there's got to be somebody at the top, some head honcho that says, okay, this is what we're doing. Um, this is, this is the, the, the path forward. So I have, I have a lot of empathy uh, for all of our leaders on all sides of the aisle early on in this thing. No one knew what it was. No one knew how to get around it. No one knew how long it was going to go on for, right? Um, and, and, it's, and it's really unfair for us to play uh, armchair quarterback on any of that stuff, right? Because people... You know, <clears throat> to kind of back up, 2017, I opened up um, the Renaissance Hotel in Reno as their executive chef. It has two restaurants, has the Shore, has um, Boondocks Bocce, which is like a, a sports bar concept. And we have a, a big banquet hall. And, uh, you know, we do uh, quite a bit of revenue um, through it. So it, we kind of like built this team over over time. Um, right in 2019, like the finishing touches uh, on the team were complete. We went to um, our uh, hotel groups, which has about you know 40 different hotels uh, in North America. We went to their award ceremony. Uh, we got for the food and beverage department, we won uh, most profitable uh, and also uh, best guest experience, which are the two uh, awards. So not only were we the most uh, profitable food and beverage. Uh, department in the company across 40 hotels, but we also had our, uh, uh the highest guest satisfaction scores. Uh, and that meant a lot to me, right? So that's, two, that's 2019, um, great year for us. And then we go into 2020, January, February is off to an amazing start. We start to hear these rumblings about this COVID thing. March rolls around. I preemptively say, Hey, look at guys, this might kind of turn into a thing. So what we're going to do is so I go to my managers and I say, uh, we need to, um, just, we need to cut labor 30% across the board. We're not laying anybody off, right? It's, uh, G uh February and March is a bit of a slower time for us anyways. So we're going to, um, cut from 20% to 30% across the board, but we're going to kind of sp space it out. We're going to give some people some vacation times. You know, we, we got a lot of, uh, you know, vacation and, and, uh, and paid time off built up uh, in the banks for a lot of our people have been around for a while. So it wasn't really going to be a, a, a big deal. We're going to be able to, to flex down and, and weather the storm. And we had that conversation, uh, literally the first week of March. Okay. 
March 17th, we get shut down. It's just, everyone go home. And I'm, I'm standing in front of, and it's brutal because I had, at that time, I had uh, roughly 100-ish employees uh, in my department. And, God, it's, I mean, it's hard to, to, to even talk about it. Um, I mean, that, that day, I had to stand in groups, right? Because we'd bring in the, the servers from the shore and the servers from Bocce and, you know, the cooks in. So, like, that entire day, I'm standing in front of these people, you know, laying them off in mass. And it was just the the most ruthless thing I've ever had to go through, especially since we were we were flying so high. You know, I was fuck, I was fucking devastated. You know, and uh, these people they worked so hard for us, so hard, and just say everyone just just go home, right? And then they said, you know, it's uh, two weeks to stop the spread, but I'm like. <laughs> that's that's not going to happen so we had our, our recall date basically a month and a half later uh with you know said hey you know so we have to temporarily lay you guys off we're going to recall you in a month and a half um and it just you know oh it was awful so anyways at the 11th hour okay i i'm basically i'm talking to the gm of the hotel and i say hey i gotta you know I need to keep on um, a couple of managers. You know, I got to keep on my my head front of the house manager, and I got to keep on my my uh, manager uh, Sh- Chef Sean, who you guys know. I got to keep him on in the back. I got to keep these two guys for at least the next two weeks because this is a a big hotel. We got a ton of kitchen space. We got to go through. We got to we got to shut everything down, right? We got we got to button it up properly. So that was the plan. Um. And at the at the very last minute, our director of uh, of sales and marketing, um, she says, "Hey, we have these airline crews that are being displaced um, from the casinos, which are completely shutting down. So they normally would would they're normally priced out of our hotel because we're just a little bit you know we're, we're a higher end sort of business travelers hotel. The casinos have, um, you know." anywhere from 800 to 2000 rooms. So they have a lot of rooms to fill. Whereas we have a, you know, 214, it's a little more boutique of a hotel, right? Um, so normally they're priced out of the market, but now the market's completely dead. The casinos are shutting down and we have these airline pilots that are, are you know, flying for UPS and FedEx and, um, you know, and, and they, they need a place to stay. So uh, chef, can you guys offer them food to go um, in their, in their rooms? And uh, we said, yeah. So we were able to to struggle through that. And I kept on, you know, my front of the house manager, Barry and Sean. And for the, the next three months, we were basically there working 12 to 14 hour shifts, right? Um, two of us were there at all times. We would open up for breakfast. We'd be there all the way through dinner. And we're just cooking these airline pilots, you know, pizza and burgers and stuff. Because we built this big machine, right? The, the worst thing we can do is shut that machine down and and not keep the 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 parts moving at least a little bit right so it was a it was a, a last minute hail mary godsend save for us to at least keep this sort of machine moving so that way uh, when we started to open back up we'd have something that was somewhat functioning uh, for our staff to come back to right it's really really hard to open up a uh, a food and beverage program that large from a dead stop okay so that's really lucky. And we were able to do that. So in, in uh, mid-June, I believe, like June 15th, when the restrictions were uh, started to alleviate, uh, we were opening back up and um, you know we were able to bring some people on. I projected that we were going to do like, I think, $30,000 uh, in the first month. You know, a normal month for us is 500000 to 800000 depending upon the, the, the time of the year. Um, and we actually did like a hundred and thirty thousand dollars that first month, which was gr- great. Even at the at the smaller capacities, we just had people coming in and get to go food, and 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 uh, you know people sitting out on our patio. We had a really nice patio um, right there on the on the Truckee River, so it started working out um, out really well for us. But um, and then you know with the whole mask thing, I mean uh, you know 
Um, it's not for me to say, you know, it's a, we're just following guidelines, right? Um, but I, I will say that, that cooking, uh, cooking on a hotline uh, with a mask or running around a restaurant all day with a mask is, is really, really difficult. It's not fun. Um, I know there's a lot of people who have to wear masks all day long in their jobs, so we're not anything special, right? I'm not asking for any sort of extra empathy. But man, if you've ever been in like a 110 degree kitchen, um, cooking hotline with a mask over your face, it really, really blows. So it's it's actually, if you go to my Instagram page, um, at Chef Jacob, um, you'll you'll see I, I post a little funny meme the, the uh, yesterday. I thought it was funny because uh, now the CDC is saying that they recommend two masks. I'm just like, oh, God damn it. Now I've got to double mask. So they haven't told us that we have to double mask um, on the on the line yet. Um, but uh, it might be coming down the coming down the pipeline, which which I hope not, because wearing one is really tough. Wearing two is just, just gonna gonna choke you out. It's gonna be hard. So anyway, so we're actually doing pretty good. And then we go into um, October. There's a little bit of like a resurgence with the COVID spike. And then November, things get really bad, but we're still actually doing really strong. Our, our, our business is, is, is good, uh, but then they, they give us new restrictions of 25% capacity um, and like, you know, tables of four. Uh, so that really sort of shut us down. Um, and, uh, you know, we were able to struggle through, but like December, uh, so going into December for at least our area, that is the, um, the busiest month by far because we do a lot of holiday parties and gatherings and things like that. Um, and, you know, obviously the holiday parties were out this year, but at the time we, they did allow smaller group gatherings. So we had some of those on the books. Um, but when the governor came out and, uh, and, and he said, and this is not to blame, you know, offer any blame, right? It's just, this is how it happened. When he comes out and says, Hey, COVID's getting worse. We can't do, uh, you know, um, tables of eight anymore. We got to drop to tables of four and you guys got to go down to 25 percent capacity not only did that limit what we were able to do but it really threw cold water on everybody's sort of spirit and 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 willingness to dine out okay um now what's what's frustrating about um this whole situation is the fact that as as things continue to progress i i really and again, I'm biased, right? You got to you got to look at it through a filter, okay? But I, I really feel like like restaurants are uh, an easy scapegoat, okay? To to blame things on, uh, it's uh, hey, we don't know the you know this COVID thing is spreading. We can't stop it. We're putting things in place. It's not working. It must be the restaurant's fault. It must be everyone gathering together, and people that are packing into nightclubs and getting drunk and hanging and kissing and all that sort of stuff, right? Like you might have an argument there, but when you have people spread out in a well ventilated area or you're doing outside dining, um, it's I guarantee I guarantee and and I guarantee you. Okay, grandma can't keep you from getting salmonella on Thanksgiving, right? So what do you think is more likely? You coming into my restaurant and getting COVID uh, with all of the, the procedures that we have in place with a four top or going to grandma's house for Thanksgiving? I mean, I'm not saying don't go to grandma's house, but let's just, let's be a little more realistic about this stuff. And they, they come at you and they say, oh, don't worry, guys. We're in all, you know, we're all in this together. Okay. But you, 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 you shut down. You shut down one of the largest industry uh, in the in the world, right? But in the United States, that's what I know of. Um, you know, so one of the largest industries in the world. You shut that down for months and months and months, um, and then you let politics uh, get in the way of actually offering anything that looked like relief. And most of these people didn't even want relief. Most of them, like, I don't want checks. Most of my people don't want checks. I mean, who doesn't like free money, right? But what we want is we want to go to work and and uh, earn a living and, and, and be sustained. Now, what? Now, the point that I'm getting to on, on this is the other day we had a health inspection. And uh, this is our second health inspection during the COVID era. Actually, technically, technically third. When we opened back up a couple months into it, my normal health inspector came in, my normal food guy came in, um, and he uh, inspected us. And... Uh, uh, everything was good, right? We always ace our, our health inspection tests or our, 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 our uh, SANT tests. They come and they, they look, they observe. So we always ace our health inspections. <clears throat> and you can see all that stuff publicly on, online. So what happened is when they shut down all of these restaurants, what they 
I think failed to realize is all these restaurants pay these inspection fees to the local health department, right? And that and that's a big part of their of their revenue. And they pay these business fees as well. Um, when those restaurants go away, they now need um, more more fee more fees. So the first time they came in, they dinged us for a few things, and they levied like you know three thousand dollars of uh, of fines, and um, it was just a money grab, right? It was it was totally shitty. So we we make some adjustments, we do a lot of staff training, and yada yada yada. Okay, then. Last week, I have three health inspectors uh, come into our property to inspect the hotel and inspect our, our restaurant areas. And uh, normally, when they come in, they're wearing like you know business casual. They got a lanyard. They're they're really low key, okay? Because you know you don't want to give the wrong impression to guests that are there actively eating that you got health inspectors uh, poking around. For the first time uh, in in my career. This guy, one of the health inspectors comes in wearing a blue jacket with yellow lettering that said health department on it, which is like what you would see in like an, uh, uh, like a DEA raid, like, like those blue jackets. Like the, it's like, so he's like health department on it. Like it looks like we're getting raided by the health department. These guys come in and they start poking around, telling us everything looks good. Oh, that looks good. That looks good. That looks good. That looks good. Right. That, that looks good. All right, cool, awesome. It's a partnership. It's a partnership between um, the 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 restaurant and the health department to keep our customers safe. Then a few days later, they send us four thousand dollars worth of fines. Right, one of them was five hundred dollars for not having paper hand towels in one of my twenty sinks. I literally in this property, I have twenty hand washing sinks around in my various kitchens. They found one in a basement banquet kitchen that we hardly ev even use, right? That had that didn't have paper towels in the dispenser. And on the other side of that kitchen there was a hand sink with paper towels in the dispenser. Normally this is a uh hey chef, that dispenser needs towels will you fix that and they write on the thing it's a you know fixed on spot and it doesn't cost you any points it's not a big deal okay um i've never in my life gotten a 500 dollar fine for not having towels in a dispenser also they don't understand these new these brand new health inspectors i've never seen in my life right they're, they're obviously new trainees they don't understand the difference between sanitizing and disinfectant disinfectant is a much higher grade of killing germs and bacteria that you don't actually use in restaurants for medical grade equipment right because when you actually use enough chemicals to disinfect something uh for like surgical gear right you leave too much residue on there that just then has a secondary cleanup process uh to be food safe right so in in restaurants we sanitize uh so we had this whole training program on how we properly sanitize we walked them through it they didn't say anything while they were there right and then they uh then in the in, in the fine that they gave us for a thousand dollars they said that we're not using the sanitizer properly uh instead of spraying it on the table and leaving it for 60 seconds before wiping uh we need to leave it for 10 minutes right which is total bullshit they don't even understand the sanitizer that they're dinging us on so we're fighting them on that and then there's just some some other like just really bizarre stuff here's my point you want to shut down our entire industry for the better part of a year right then you want to say, hey, we're in this together. We're a team. And then you send your health department to my restaurant in a, in a, in a pure money grab, right? In a pure money grab. Has nothing to do with customer safety, right? Fuck you. Like, really? Like, we're, like, we're supposed... $4,000, $4,000, Okay. In a in a environment where we've been getting hammered for the last eleven months, and profit margins are notoriously slim. Now I'm one of the more luckier ones, right? I have good, I have decent revenues, and I have a, a machine that does decent profits. Okay, but you do two. So we did. We're gonna do about two hundred thousand dollars in revenue this month, maybe a little bit more. Okay. $4,000, that's 2% of profit points. That's 2% of my revenue, right? So you 
you come in in your bullshit DEA jackets, right? Uh, when it says health department, you smile on my face and then you say, yeah, we're going to take 2% of your fucking profit margins, right? For some hand towels and a disinfectant that we don't understand, even though you technically are following the, the CDC guidelines. And then we have people start wanting to talk about how we're all in this together. So yeah, uh, there's, there's a little bit of anger there and there's a little bit of frustration there. But here's the thing, don't don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. We're not victims. Okay? We're leaders. And I'm and I'm talking specifically to my restaurant people right now. We're leaders. We gotta lead our teams out of this. We gotta lead our industry out of this. This is a really rough time. And everyone who gets out on the other side of this. Uh, is going to be stronger and better and more honed for the future. The people who had, had stayed working through this entire process, um, you know, that's it's you're just going to be that much of of a of a better chef. So you can be frustrated, you could be angry, but you cannot fall into that victim mentality, that victim mindset. Because when you do that, you are then giving power to other people. Okay, that's part of the victim mindset. So instead, you gotta you gotta take that power back, and you gotta lead your teams out of this. A really great book that I love that I read earlier uh, early on in my, in my career is called "The Obstacle Is the Way." And the gist of this book is basically whatever you want is on the other side of that obstacle. And so many people quit. And a a, a, a line that he has in the book that I'm paraphrasing because it's been a while since I read it, but it really resonated with me is. The final mile, or no, it was more something like, uh, oh, resistance is greatest near the finish line. And that really, that, that, that really resonated with me because you, you come against these obstacles, you hit it, you hit it, you hit it, you want to quit, right? You get frustrated. You want to just go home and lick your wounds, but you got to have that voice in the back of your head that says, hey, you're, you're getting closer. You're getting closer to that finish line because resistance is always the hardest always the most difficult as you near that finish line. You know, you go out, you run a you run a marathon, you know, mile 1, mile 2, mile 10, eh, right? Mile 26, that's the that's the real mile, right? Where you got to dig down, you got to find uh that fortitude. So, it's been it's been a tough road. Um I can only give you the perspective of the restaurant industry. Um I know that there's many many other industries out there that are having um a, a tough time as well. So that's not to detract uh, from any of them. Um, and I don't want to uh, play armchair quarterback on people who were uh, put in these impossible situations and, and, and had to be, and had to make some decisions. But I think at this point, it would be really nice if we all just took a step back and had a little bit of common sense and a little bit of empathy, right? A little bit of empathy. If you're, if you're levying fines against, against restaurants, for little tiny things that are obviously money grabs, um, you're, I don't even know what to tell you. And that's, and, and, and that's sort of the same thing where like, you know, went on that whole rant about, about food riders the other day. I mean, there's some anger there because the food riders are starting to emerge again, the food journalists, right? Um, they're starting to emerge again and, and, uh, you know, contacting chefs about, Hey, we got this upcoming spread that we want to do. Um, and, uh, you know, do you want to be a part of it? Do you want to, um, you know, write something for us or whatever it might be. Right. Uh, and and, because they, they, again, they need us chefs, they need us restaurants to create things, uh, that they can write about, you know, so, so their industry as food writers is dependent on us. And it, and in a perfect world, it's a, uh, it's a symbiotic relationship, right? We create great stuff. They write about our creations in their own right. They're creating and it's all good. But what I want to say, and what I what I hope um, that all of my chef friends say out there, the next time a food writer contacts you uh, for some content and to do a spread, you say, yeah, I'd be happy to do that for you. I'd love to be a part of that. Uh, just one quick request. Um, what I'd like you to do is send me an article that you wrote between the time frame of March 2020 and February 2021 in defense of my industry. Just send me one article with your name on it, with that date stamp on it, 
where you defended my industry when it was getting fucking eviscerated, when I was laying people off in mass, when people were relapsing into drug abuse and alcohol addictions, right, because they had nothing else to do with their fucking lives, right? Where was your GoFundMe? Did you do a GoFundMe for chefs, the people who pay your fucking bills, the people who create the content that you write about, right? Where were you then? Oh, you have an article on it. Oh, you did a GoFundMe. Awesome. Let's do some business. Let's talk. You were crickets. And now that things are getting back to normal, you want to come and do a fucking spring spread on my food? You want free content? When my industry was getting fucking eviscerated by you, not by you, but getting eviscerated with zero, all these people, they're your best friends, right? Where are the lawyers? All these lawyers that come into our restaurants, all these lawyers that come into our restaurants and have these high flutin meals and do these business deals over fat bottles of wine, right? They come and they celebrate their big cases in our restaurants, right? Where were they? Where were they? None of them wanted to represent us as a group pro bono. And we got it pretty easy in Nevada. Okay. We got, I'm, I'm, I'm in Reno. We actually got it pretty easy. California, New York, those guys got fucked. They got fucked and they had zero representation. They had zero empathy. They had nobody fighting for them except the people within their industry. So all of these people who feed off of our industry when things are good, where were they when times got tough? And when you go out and you hire your lawyer, when you hire your PR team, right? When you do business, when, when people inevitably come and say, hey, would you like to advertise in our local publication? I hope you ask them those questions before you spend money with them. So... Yeah, that's how I feel about that. All right, well, a little bit clunky. I mean, we were on such a great roll with the uh, the YouTube live stream, and uh, it's going to take some time to edit all of this stuff together. Um, I appreciate everybody who, uh, who, who tuned in. Jacob Burton for Congress. God. Do you hate me? I wouldn't wish that shit on anybody. Are you kidding me right now? Oh my my goodness. I just I want to get back. I want to just I I want to get back to just cooking for people. You know, having my team cook for people. It's just, you know and 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 uh, again, it's um a little bit of empathy. Okay? Just a little bit of just understanding. And that goes all the way around. Okay? Again, I'm not trying to play armchair quarterback on the people who were in charge during this time. They were put in an impossible situation, but at a certain time, the, the, the clock runs out. At a certain point, the clock runs out, and it's time to actually start doing some real solutions. And I know that there's some, some solutions in the works, right? we got a vaccine being distributed. We got, I mean, things are looking good. They're looking rosy. They're looking better than they did, uh, uh, you know, three to, to, to six months ago because we're just at a different point in this whole pandemic's life cycle. Right. But there were decisions that I feel were made for my industry uh, that were absolutely heartless, absolutely heartless. And, um, <laughs> and, it's, and they were so busy playing politics amongst themselves that they, they couldn't even get any sort of real help passed. We got one check at the beginning of this thing. We got another six hundred dollars ten months later. Uh, the the whole thing's just fucking insulting. <laughs> so, um, so restaurant people, okay, take this as a lesson. Let it sharpen uh, your resolve, and set yourself up for success. Have that rainy day fund, both personally and professionally. One of the things that got us through this is when we relaunched and the numbers were totally fucked, right? Because it's it's hard enough to open something up to basically launch a restaurant in normal times. We were relaunching our, our food and beverage program in the middle of a pandemic, right? 
But because we were so profitable and strong going into this, I had some accruals on the books. And these accruals were able to, to uh, you know, basically, so these prepaid expenses that I had kind of sitting almost like in a savings account um, on the P&L, I was able to use those to smooth over the rough patches in our profitability when, when we reopened, right? So if you are a, uh, you know, a, a normal restaurant tour, same thing goes for you, right? You need to have a rainy day fund, so, uh, hopefully within you know uh, six months of operating expenses um, at the least, right? Now, what COVID has told us, you probably need something more like nine, and at the very least, have some sort of personal rainy day fund. Um, you know, you got you got to be prepared for something like this to happen, um, and uh, you know, we you just got to stick together. We have to stick together in this industry uh, because w what we've um, what we we've seen is when something like this goes down and shit hits the fan, it's basically everybody for themselves. You know, um, that's just human nature, neither right nor wrong, but it is what it is. So as an industry, we need to we need to uh, get together with each other. Uh, we need to help one another. We need to build one another up, and we need to call bullshit on people that. Uh, uh, that build their ecosystems off of our industry, um, but don't really give much in return, especially when we need them. All right. Da, 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 da. Everyone needs some Dave Ramsey in their life. Absolutely. I agree with that. I love me some Dave Ramsey. Um, so anyways, that's good advice. That was a good podcast, man. I'm sorry that we, uh, cutting it out there we'll get these uh streaming things uh uh figured out eventually and it's gonna probably take me a, a day or two to edit all this stuff together so for those of you who are looking for the audio uh replay feed um this will probably be up in one cohesive piece that you can rewatch in the next probably sometime this weekend oh and it's also valentine's day and presents weekend so i'm gonna be busy i'm gonna go into work and i'm gonna get crushed for the next three days um, so that's that. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you guys. Same bat time, same bat place, 7 a.m. Um, Pacific Standard Time, 10 a.m. Eastern. We'll probably just do it in the Facebook group since, uh, unfortunately, uh, YouTube was such a shit show. And uh, we'll go from there. Thanks, everyone. Uh, have a great weekend and uh, cook something delicious.